All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started tonight. This was to be our last night of Zoom studies, and then next week we'll start with just a pre recorded lesson on YouTube. But I was, you know, home group started this week, and so I was pretty sure I wasn't going to get anybody here in the live Zoom audience tonight, but I will record it in Zoom tonight just in case anybody jumps on late. We had a couple, we had a latecomer jump in last week. So just in case that happens, I'll record it here on Zoom tonight. Starting next week, I'll just pre record a lesson and put it on our YouTube channel. There is a Pastor's Bible Study uh, play, playlist there on YouTube, and so that's where you'll find the studies next week. I'll also share the link on Facebook, just like I have been uh, these past several weeks, but that'll be next week. We won't have it via Zoom. It'll just be a pre-recorded study. Um, and, and to be perfectly honest, I don't know what I'm gonna do yet. Um, I haven't decided what that study will look like. So just join us next week. It'll be a surprise. and. Uh, jump in next week and just watch the, the lessons on YouTube. And, and I think for, for most people, now that our fall schedule has started back up again, I think that's gonna work out a whole lot better because it, you can watch this lesson, you can jump in and watch the study whenever it's convenient for you. Um, and, and I think I mentioned this last week, what I didn't wanna do with this study with the home group starting back up, the men's study going on, the ladies study starting back, has started back up. And what I didn't want was this to become just one more thing you felt like you had to do. And so that's why we're going to the pre-recorded session. So you can watch it or not at your leisure. That way you can kind of fit it into your schedule, whatever works best for you. So tonight we're doing one more question, one more of these kind of what does the Bible say about kind of questions. And this will probably be our last sort of apologetic series. That's what these have been. Uh, apologetics doesn't mean we're apologizing for a faith, our faith. It means we're defending it. What do we believe and why do we believe it? And these, what does the Bible say about questions really are kind of apologetics issues. And so we're doing the one, maybe the last one tonight. Uh, what does the Bible say about? And the question tonight we're looking at is, are the Bible and evolution compatible? And as the, you know, if your kids are going to public school, they are being taught that evolution is a scientific fact. That's the way mankind came into being. That's the way we ended up on this planet. They're also being taught, sort of implied, if not directly taught, that then the story of creation in Genesis is just a myth. It didn't happen because evolution is a fact, and that's the way things took place. And so then the question for us as believers is, is there any compatibility? Can I, as a Christian, can I believe in evolution and believe in the authority and the inerrancy of scripture? And so that's the question we're gonna, we're gonna tackle tonight. Now, this, like most other questions, there's a whole lot more depth uh, that we could cover. We talked about the rapture last week and there is a whole lot more depth that we could cover in that topic. And same thing here, but we're gonna try to take this question tonight and hit some of the big muscle movements, some of the big questions, and I'm kind of break this down into some sub-questions, but some of, the, some of the key questions that we come into, when we come into this creationism versus evolution argument. So if you've got a Bible with you there, I invite you to open up Genesis chapter 2. That's the biblical account of the creation of man, and we talk about evolution. That's really the question at hand. Where did mankind come from? How do we end up on this planet in the first place? So you follow along Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Then I'll open us up in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into trying to tackle this question for tonight. So follow along there in Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heaven and the earth were completed in all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then the Lord blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the account of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth. And there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise up from the earth and, and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Okay, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that we have this incredible gift of your word. 
and these arguments, these discussions that we find ourselves in today, this issue particularly about evolution or is it creation? How did we end up on this planet? Well, we thank you that we can turn to your word. It's sufficient. It answers every question that we will have. It's got something to say about every issue in life. It specifically has something to say about this issue. And so, Father, we pray as we open your word tonight, as we think about and consider this question, Lord, would you be our teacher? Would you help us to understand what you would have for us? Uh, instruct our hearts as believers who want to follow after you, who want to take your word seriously, and instruct our hearts concerning this issue and whether we as believers can see these two things as compatible. Would you bless our time together? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I mentioned we're going to break this down into several sub-questions. And the sub-questions are this, is the Bible at odds with science? It's one of the questions that floats around, one of, the, one of the challenges, I suppose, to the Bible that floats around. Is that people say, well, listen, science teaches that evolution is true. If you believe the Bible, you must be anti-science. And so the question, one of the sub-questions we'll look at is, is the Bible at odds with science? Is that something that we should see uh, as the case? Um, and then we will look at evolution not as a scientific theory, because really it's less of that, although it's called that a scientific theory, but really that it is a religious philosophy. And I want us to see that tonight, that there is something going on here. This is why this continues to be taught, not because it's hard science, not because it's good science, but because it is a religious philosophy. Then I want us to ask the question, is the Bible and are the Bible and evolution compatible? And we'll see that. We'll kind of pick that apart for just a few minutes. Um, and then I want us to look at the final issue, maybe not so much a question, but the issue, and that is that, un that evolution really undermines the core beliefs of Christianity. So I think I've probably already answered the question, uh, just in that statement alone, are the Bible and evolution compatible? And I think, spoiler alert, the answer to that is no. They absolutely are not. As believers, we can't on one hand say that we believe that the Bible is true, and it's, in, it's inerrant, it's the word of God, it's infallible. We can't on one hand say that, but then on the other hand say, yes, but I believe evolution is true. Those two things are simply incompatible. Let's start picking these, these questions, these thoughts apart and see why that is true. So the first question that I want us to think about is, is the Bible at odds with science? As I mentioned that, when we get into discussions about this, that's the challenge. If you believe the Bible, you are anti-science. If you believe science and you are scientific, then you can't possibly believe the Bible. Are the two things at odds? No, they absolutely are not at odds. Uh, in fact, I would say, uh, and I'll, I'll unpack this here in just a second, but I would say my estimation is that the Bible is more compatible with science than the theory of evolution is. And I know that's not the popular opinion, right? That's not what we usually hear. What we hear is that evolution is a scientific theory, but I think as we kind of look at this a little bit, we'll see that I, the, the things that they have discovered scientifically line up perfectly with what the word of God has told us all along. And yet the, the theory of evolution stands in stark contrast to some of the key principles and key scientific laws. So let's just look at a few scientific principles and we'll see that, that, that not only are the Bible and science not at odds, but the Bible is a better aligned with science than evolution does. One of the basic assumptions in any of the hard sciences, by hard sciences, I mean biology, chemistry, physics, as opposed to sciences like economics or sociology, the more soft sciences, but in any of the hard sciences, one of the basic assumptions is that everything in nature has a cause and that that cause can be known. I mean, if you think about it, that's really the only reason that scientists do what they do anyway. I mean, if, if there's no assumption that the things that they're seeing, the actions, the reactions, stuff like that, if there's no assumption that those things have a cause, well, then why, why investigate it? Why run experiments? Why even spend their time? So they come at it with a basic assumption. Everything has a cause, that cause can be discovered. And we see when we come to the issue of where did mankind come from? Where did the universe come from? Where did all of this stuff come from? We look at the very first 
sentence in the Bible, the very first verse of the very first chapter of the very first book, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We want, want to know what's the cause? What's the first cause? Where did everything come from? That's where it all came from. We trace everything back to its origin. Okay, what's the cause of the universe? What's the cause of mankind being here? What's the cause of planet Earth? There's the answer. It all traces back. And that lines up with that basic scientific principle. Everything has a cause. In fact, in John's gospel, John says it the same idea. He says a little bit differently. He says this, John chapter 1, verse 3. He said, all things came into being through him. He's talking about through Jesus. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Everything, we trace back the cause, there we have the cause. The Big Bang Theory. I know we're talking about evolution, but those two really are kind of a box set. And you can't have one without the other. You can't talk about evolution without talking about the Big Bang Theory. They really do go together. They, they can't be really separated. The Big Bang Theory says that matter just was. There was this big blob of matter that exploded. It became the universe. No, no cause, no definable cause. They don't even know what it was. It was just there. There's no answer to that. There is no cause there. Evolution says that all of life started in a, in a puddle of primordial ooze millions and millions and millions of years ago. There's no definable cause for how life got there or how it began. It just did. And when we think about, well, isn't the, well, the, one of the basic assumptions of science is that there is a cause, that cause can be known, and yet we come to the issue of that's, that's we're told is the scientific answer of where everything came from, is that there is no cause. There is nothing that can be discovered there. And we, and we start to realize a little bit that maybe this isn't as scientific as we thought it was. One of the other things I... Is we, is we consider the question of are the Bible and, and science compatible, is what they call the law of con conservation of mass. Now, that won't be on the test later, but, but what this law basically says is that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It just changes form. And this was discovered in 1785 by a French physicist, and I botch his name, so I'm not going to try to say it. But the law of conservation of mass, basically that matter cannot be created, it cannot be destroyed, it merely changes form. So in other words, all the stuff we have in the universe, we have everything we're gonna get. And all the building blocks, all the pieces, all the parts of everything, matters, the atoms, all of that, we have everything that we're gonna get. And so there's no more stuff coming into the universe. In Genesis chapter 2, we just read those opening verses in Genesis chapter 2. And we get down to verses 3 and 4. Well, in verse 2, it says that on the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. He rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day. He sanctified it because he rested on it from all the work which he had made. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Every single thing was created right there. And so all of the mass, all of the particles, all the pieces in the universe were created right there by the hand of God. Everything was, I mean, and everything fits perfectly together. That's the other thing we see in the universe, like, like Lego pieces, right? Everything fits together almost like it was designed that way for all of these pieces to fit perfectly together. Evolution, on the other hand, requires, of course, first that the Big Bang theory happened. And at Big Bang, what we're told took place is there was this undefined blob of energy, this undefined blob of mass. They don't know what it was. They can't go back, back and test it. They can't figure out what that looked like. They can't know. And as the theory goes, before Big Bang, there was nothing. I don't know where this mass came from. That's, that's the question. If, if everything, uh, all matter cannot be created or destroyed, well, then where did this blob of mass come from? Couldn't have created itself. Ma mass doesn't do that. Matter doesn't do that. But they don't know where it came from. There's no explanation. Science can't explain it. 
because scientists understand, I think somewhere deep down inside, they, they get this, that Big Bang is incompatible with this law of science. There has to be some other explanation for how things got here because Big Bang violates this law of science. It's incompatible. One of the other laws of science, and then we'll get off of this and talk more bible stuff. Uh, one of the other laws of science is called the law of entropy. And this basically says this, that everything is breaking down over time. It's going from a state of order to a state of chaos. And it's this law, by the way, that we all have to shake our fist at on every birthday. It's this law, the law of entropy, that is responsible for the fact that at age 51, I can't do what I could do at age 25. That's the law of entropy at work. Everything is breaking down over time. And this is what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 21. He said, the creation itself will one day be set free, listen to this, from its bondage to decay. Listen, the Bible has known this all along. God told us this all the way back in the first century. And this law of entropy was really not discovered until the mid-1800s. It took us that long to catch up to what the Bible had told us all along, that everything is breaking down over time. Now, here's why this law is important to this discussion, particularly about the Bible and science and, and whether belief in the Bible means that you don't believe in science. Evolution, frankly, in my opinion, should have been discarded years ago on this law alone. Big Bang and evolution, they tell us this, that for millions and millions and millions of years, everything went from chaos to order, right? You had that big blob, that big blob of matter, that big blob of mass, and it exploded. And at that point, it was utter chaos in the universe. And so over the course of the next millions and millions of years, the atoms formed together and they all connected together and everything was going from chaos to a state of order. And even once the planets were formed, there was this then this thing in the puddle of primordial ooze that then started to evolve into higher and higher life forms. It was going from chaos to order. And if evolutionists are correct, this went on for about 100,000 years. That's when they say that mankind first appeared on the earth, first evolved. But here's the thing. What they don't explain, what they can't even try to explain, is that somewhere along the way it switched. That, we, that things were going from order to chaos, but somewhere along the way it switched so that those scientists in the 1800s discovered that, wait a minute, everything in nature is going from order to chaos. It's all breaking down. It's not going the other way. I think I just said that wrong a minute ago. Initially, it was going from chaos to order. And somewhere it switched. And in the 1800s, they discovered that's not the case. Things are breaking down over time. They're not getting better. Now, here's the thing. This is significant because evolutionists do not offer an explanation for how this happened. How did the switch take place? At what point in time did things stop becoming more orderly and start breaking down? There's no explanation for how that happened. There's no explanation for why that happened, when it happened. There is no explanation because it isn't true. The Bible is not at odds with science. And these are major scientific discoveries that, that really it took mankind several centuries, many centuries to finally catch up with what the Bible had told us all along. Evolution, on the other hand, when you look at it and you compare it to these, these scientific principles, is at odds with science. Now that begs a big question though, right? If evolution is at odds with science, why, why are we still teaching it as science? Why are we still talking about it in schools like it is real, like it is a fact? So that's the next thing I want to talk about, is why we're doing that, and it's this reason. Evolution is not really so much a scientific theory as it is a religious philosophy. Our youngest daughter was a biology major in college, and she contacted me one day and she said, Dad, my textbook and my teacher both say that evolution is a proven fact. 
But as a Christian, how do I respond to that? See, they're told that evolution is a scientific fact that's supported by vast amounts of evidence. And if you just think about it, most of that evidence we should find as fossils, right? Because that's about all we would see. If, if evolution really took place, then we would see it in the fossil evidence. And what they're told in school, what she was told in her biology classes, is that there are these vast amounts of evidence that supports evolution. Charles Darwin, the one who came up with this theory, wrote in his book on the origins of the species, and that's really where he laid out his theory of evolution. He said this. He said, one day, fossil hunters would eventually find a great many transitional intermediates between the major groups. What he's talking about there, in other words, is as, as the story goes, as apes evolved into man, well, what he said is that fossil hunters would find a lot of the, the fossils that represented the in-between time. Not, no longer an ape, but not quite a man, and somewhere in between. And he said, listen, as time goes on, now that they're looking for them, fossil hunters are going to find tons of these things, and you would expect that as true. But here's the problem. They haven't. There is not this, these vast piles of fossil evidence that, that, would, that point directly to it. I went to the Smithsonian Institute webpage, and I searched on their webpage for evidence of human evolution. Now, I would think this is the Smithsonian Institute. So if there's going to be anybody that's going to have some good, solid evidence, point me to this mountain of fossil evidence that Charles Darwin said we're going to find that as fossil hunters begin to look. And you know what they, they talked about? They really only talked about one major fossil they found. One they found in the mid-70s, uh, uh, this fossil that they have named Lucy. And if you Google that, you'll find some discussion about Lucy. Lucy, they say, lived three and a half million years ago. Now, I just want us to pick that idea apart for a minute because in three and a half million years of evolution, the vast amounts of evidence seems to amount to one fossil. Now listen, if, if, we, if we do the math on that, this simply doesn't make any sense. If just one ape or chimpanzee or whatever it is that they say eventually evolved into a man, if just one ape lived a year, every year, for each of those 3.5 million years, there would be 3.5 million fossils. If 100 apes lived a year, there would be 350 million fossils. If 1,000 apes a year, 3.5 billion fossils. The question is, where is this vast amount of evidence? The vast evidence is one one single fossil that they point to. And I want you to listen to the description of Lucy from the Smithsonian Institute website. She had a flatter skull with a protruding jawline, long, powerful arms, hands and feet that were curled to allow her to climb trees. Now, I'm not a zoologist. I have never, I've been to zoos and I've looked at animals, but I have never really studied them deeply. I'm not, that's not my field of expertise. But I gotta be honest, you know what that sounds like to me? An ape. That doesn't sound like it's any kind of transitional animal, some sort of transitional species, almost a human being. That sounds just like an ape to me. And so when we think about this vast evidence, the, the issue is this, it's the case of Scientists making a conclusion, Lucy must be a transitional species, and they make a conclusion before they look at the evidence, and then their conclusion clouds the evidence they're looking at. Much of the fossil evidence in other species consists to what amounts to variations within the species, and that is a valid form of evolution, microevolution, they call that. Variations within the species. We see that even in, in human beings. If you have human beings who live, uh, Eskimos, for example, that live in, in extremely cold climates, over time, the generations, their bodies adapt to those climates. They have thicker skin, potentially, than the rest of us. They maybe grow more hair than the rest of us, so they have, conserve their body heat. 
maybe retain more fat. That's microevolution within the species. Then most of the fossil evidence they see is that. It's just, it's just variations within the same species. But there really isn't this vast amount of evidence. So then the question is, why do they still teach evolution as fact in the schools? It's not, there's no evidence, that, or very little evidence, that, and they have to stretch it at that to try to make that fit. Why do they teach it as a fact in school? Here's why. Because in 1987, the Supreme Court of the United States decided that creationism or any other viewpoint did not need to be taught. That they could, they could teach evolution as fact, they didn't have to introduce any other thoughts. They didn't have to introduce any competing theories. That's all they needed to do. And this sealed the notion that evolution not only could, but in fact would be taught as a fact. And here's the significance of that issue. That evolution is taught in our schools and taught as a fact, not because scientists have proven it, but because judges have mandated it. It's not a, it's not science. It's not good science anyway. But I, but my, my thought, my idea for this, this point was that evolution is a religion, religious philosophy. And it may not be good science, but that doesn't mean it's religion. But just consider the basic idea of evolution. And we see that it is in fact a religious philosophy. The, the basic idea is this, that nature is all there is. And nature is all that there ever was. And it is all that there will ever will be. Nature is supreme. It and it alone is responsible for everything. And so we owe our allegiance to nature. We owe our obedience, if you will, to nature. We owe our very existence to nature. Now consider this definition of paganism. And by the way, this definition comes from the Pagan Federation. So I think if anybody knows what the, uh, the good, solid, true definition of being a pagan looks like, this is the group that would know. This is their definition of paganism. A polytheistic or pantheistic nature-worshipping religion. Now, pantheism, pantheistic, means that everything is God. You know, polytheism means they believe in many gods. Pantheism means they believe everything is God. Everything collectively is God. And they go on. Say so paganism, it adheres, it, it, its adherents worship nature, represented by many goddesses and gods. This outlook, this is significant. This outlook sees nature as a manifestation of divinity. In other words, nature is God. And that that divination and magic are accepted as parts of life. Think again about the basic assumption, the basic idea of evolution. Nature is all there ever was. Nature is all there is, all there ever will be. It is supreme because it created us. Evolution is nothing more than paganism dressed up in a brand new suit of clothes. It's just repackaged paganism from days gone by to a new set of terms that they use today. So evolution is not the scientific slam dunk that our children are being taught in school that it is. In fact, it's a belief system that is not based on scientific explanations for how everything began, but it relies on this mysterious process that can't be explained, it can't be proven. And so it really it resembles in many ways, most ways, it more resembles a religious philosophy than a system of scientific thought. Now, the question we came here tonight for that we started at this, our time together is, is evolution incompatible with the Bible? Are those two things incompatible? And, and I, yes, I believe that they absolutely are. The consistent message of the Bible is creator focused, God focused. Everything in scripture from that first word in Genesis to the very last word in the last chapter of the Revelation, everything in the Bible is God focused. We read it just a moment ago, Genesis 1 1. God created. It goes on. God hovered. 
It says God said, he spoke, God saw, God called, God made, God called forth. Everything in the creation account, just in the first chapter of the Bible, everything is so very God-focused. The entire message of the Bible is God-focused. Not just in the big muscle movements of creation, but in the very intimate, personal way in which mankind was created. And we saw that just a few minutes ago in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. When the Lord God formed the formed man of dust to the ground, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It's a very intimate connection that God personally gets involved in man's creation. All throughout the Bible, the main character is not us. God is the main character. His work is the main event. His plan is the point of Scripture. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For in him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. In other words, God made it all, and it all belongs to him. Jesus was right there at the moment of creation, the all three members of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all involved, right there in the creation. It was all made by him and for him. It goes on, Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He, Jesus, not nature, God in the flesh, is eternal. He's not only the central focus of, of the creation act, he's the owner of everything. That's what it means. When we look at creation, we say God is supreme. God owns it because God made it. And he remains engaged, holding it all together. Why do you, what, what do you think keeps this, the, the universe from flying apart? Keeps our planet from just coming apart in pieces. Keeps our body together. It's, it's the, in, the God at work in this world holding it all together. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning. He is the end. The, the entire message of Scripture is very much God-focused from the very first act of creation to the very end of God's plan, to the end that we're told about of God's plan at the end of Revelation. The Bible tells us of the purposeful nature of God, and that's reflected in his creation. Listen, the, the thing that is created is going to reflect the character of the creator, right? If nature and these random processes are responsible for, for the creation of everything that we would expect, nothing really would follow a pattern. It would just all be random in, in, in nature. But nature reflects the purposeful nature of God, the purposeful character of God. The Bible says that God has a will. He has a plan. That what he creates, he makes with order and he makes with purpose. We read in the Old Testament, he made a nation for himself, and he did that with a purpose. He said this, 2 Samuel chapter 7, the, the purpose that your name might be made great, that his name might be made great. He saves people with a purpose. Ephesians chapter 1 says that our salvation is this, might be to the praise of his glory. Even the things that he does, it doesn't just rec represent his order and his purpose and his character even everything he does is completely god focused evolution though on the other hand and this is where we really see that as a bible believing christian i can't hang on to that belief system evolution is entirely creation focused the bible's creator focused evolution is creation focused it is a direct attempt to remove god from the picture Make mankind the main event. Make Mother Earth the main event. Make the planet, the environment, the main event. But to entirely remove God from the picture. In evolution, there's no purpose. There's no reason. There's no plan. There's nothing. And if evolution is true and the Genesis account is not, then really can we trust anything in the Bible? That's why this really is an issue that says we cannot Hold both of these truths. 
that I believe the Bible is inerrant and, and infallible and inspired at the same time I hang on to evolution. Because if evolution is true, then the very first chapter of the Bible is not. And if it starts off with a falsehood, well, can we believe anything in it? The placement at the very beginning of the Bible of the creation account tells us how significant it is. It's something incredibly important that we need to know, not just for, to answer the question where we came from, but who is God? We learn so much about him from it. Are the Bible and evolution compatible? Absolutely not. As a Bible-believing Christian, can I hang on to the theory of evolution? No, we absolutely can't. It runs counter to everything that the Bible teaches. And that's the last thing I want to say to talk about that evolution undermines the core beliefs of Christianity. Now, let me peel back that onion just a little bit. We only have about 10 minutes or so left, so let me peel back that onion just a little bit. Other than in concepts, how is evolution incompatible with the core beliefs of Christianity? Well, we already touched on this a little bit. The very first lesson we did in this series was we were talking about the Bible. What is it? When we pick up this book and we read it, what do we have in our hands? And you remember we talked about this is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of God. This is what he breathed from his heart and mind to us. And we had touched on this a little bit. If evolution is true, then the Bible is not. It's just like any other book, but worse. We know it starts off with a lie and does just go downhill from there. We, that very first lesson we talked about this, the reason we believe the Bible is because it's God breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16. That means that what we have here came from the very breath of God, his words, that he spoke directly for our benefit. Another reason we believe the Bible, because of what Peter says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. No prophecy was ever, ever made by act of human will. But men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Men like Peter, Paul, Matthew, Mark, and the others, they may have taken the pen or the quill and put it to the parchment. But it was the Spirit of God who provided them the content. And because God is its author, I know we're reviewing that first lesson now, but because God is its author, it cannot make mistakes. Because God can't make mistakes. But here's the thing, if evolution is true, none of that is. This is just like any other book, just like any other work of fiction, because it starts off with a story that isn't true, if evolution is. It cuts at one of the, one of the core beliefs, the, the foundational truths of Christianity. Not only the Word of God, though. Evolution undermines the God of the Word. Not just the Word of God, but the God of the Word. Creation tells us more than just about what or how, how we came into being, what happened there in the beginning. The creation account in Genesis tells us about who. It tells us a great deal about God. God as the creator of all things. He and he alone has the right to be declared king of kings, lord of lords. No matter who rises to power in this world, God, they only rise to power in this world because God created this world. They're only on this planet because God created them. He is above every single thing. He owns it all. King of kings, Lord of lords. What sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator. This is what I, Isaiah said, Isaiah 45, 9. Does the clay dispute with the potter saying, stop doing, you're doing it wrong? Well, what a crazy idea that we could push back on God and say, we don't like what, what is happening here. He is ultimately sovereign. He is over it all because he created it all. That means he owns it all. Evolution is nothing more than a thinly veiled attempt to cut God out of the picture. And then to remove our accountability to him, that really is what it's all about. If I can convince myself that nature is responsible for everything. Well, I'm accountable to nature. I'm accountable to myself. I'm not accountable to God. He's not responsible for any of this. And it really is a, a thinly veiled attempt 
to cut God out of the picture, remove our sense of accountability to the one who created everything. And it undermines not just the accountability, the authority of God, it undermines the personal nature of God. God is a personal God. There is a concept, sometimes they try to marry these two things together, and they say, well, okay, but maybe God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1, but then he used evolution to create everything else. Theistic evolution, they call it. God controlled evolution. That's how he created everything. But theistic evolution really just kind of says this, that God is this distant, uncaring, uninvolved God. I've heard it described as like a, a guy who winds up an alarm clock and then he just sits the clock on the desk and lets it do its thing. And that's really what the idea of theistic evolution looks at that way. God just wound the clock. He just lets it go after that. Got the process going and stepped out. But then they create this impersonal, distant, uncaring, uninvolved God. But John John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus said this, that they may know you. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him. Listen, if God is distant, if he's just letting the clock he made just wind down, I mean, does, does God care at all about us? Does he care about our eternity? Does he care about what happens in our lives? And yet what we read in his word is he does. The fact that he loved the world so much to send his only son tells us he's not distant. He's not uncaring. He's not uninvolved. Why would he do that if he was just some distant God? The last thing I'll mention is this, and this is maybe is the most significant as far as how evolution undercuts the, the core doctrine, the core beliefs of Christianity. Evolution undermines our need for a savior. Listen, you have to recognize that sin is rampant in this world. You have to recognize that no matter how many years have passed and how many technological advances that mankind has made, we've not corrected the basic problems of the human heart. Hatred, anger, injustice, all of those things, we've not created, we've not fixed any of that stuff. We are desperately in need of a savior to do something for us that we desperately cannot do for ourselves. But evolution undercuts that. Genesis chapter 3, we didn't read that tonight, but you're familiar with it. Genesis chapter 3 describes the fall of man. And when Adam and Eve in the garden sinned and they ate from the tree that God told them not to eat from, sin now drove a wedge between God and man. They were driven from the garden. And more importantly, though, not just driven from a garden, they were driven from the presence of God. That's what sin has done. It's driven a wedge between us and God. And Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 that death and sin spread to all men as a result of that. You are born with that, that sin nature in our hearts. And because of that fall, because of the presence of sin in this world that nobody can deny, nobody can really say it's not there. And because of that, we need a savior. But listen, if man evolved from a bucket of primordial soup, then there was no Adam. There was no tree of knowledge of good and evil. There was no sin. There was no garden. There is no need for a savior. So don't let the, the message of the world, don't let Satan's ideas convince you that you can say, well, I believe the Bible, but I also believe evolution. Because if you believe evolution, then you have to seriously question whether you truly do believe the Bible. Because it undercuts not just the authority of God's word, it undercuts the, the character and the nature of the God of the word, and it undercuts the core basic beliefs of Christianity. Now, as with last week's topic, there is a lot more that could be said. So I want to end our time tonight with just a couple of resources that I'll, I'll give you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to type the websites here in a Word document and I'll share them for you. 
I should have done this before I started, but I didn't. Okay, so let me share these with you so you can see them. A couple of resources, places you can go if you've got questions, you want some more information, you want to look at this a little bit further because there is a lot more that could be said here. So I hope you can see that on the screen there. Answersingenesis.org. And by the way, our youth group, uh, Michael and Natasha Stoiber just began teaching our youth ministry a couple of Sundays ago, and they are using material from Answers in Genesis. But it, it's a great place to go. It's a great apologetics website. This other site, reasonablefaith.org. It's, it's a man by the name of Dr. William Lane Craig. And he, he would go through a lot of topics. He, he touches on a lot of topics, a lot of apologetics issues, but you can go on there, search for evolution in the Bible, and you'll find several articles to talk about it. Ravi Zacharias's website, I should have typed this one on there as well, rzim.org. Dr. Ravi Zacharias just passed away a few months ago, but a powerful apologist and his website is a tremendous place to go if you've got some more questions about this issue of can i find some more about whether the bible and evolution are compatible let me end with this quote and i think this is very telling about the, the nature and the state of those who believe in evolution this is a quote by a man named dr george wald now you've probably never heard of him i never did until i came across this this quote, Dr. Wald is the professor emeritus of biology at Harvard University. Okay, so this guy's no slack in his field. Now, this is what he said. He said there are only two possibilities as to how life arose. One is spontaneous gener generation arising to evolution. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. There is no third possibility. Remember, professor emeritus of biology at Harvard University. That's it. There are only those two options. Spontaneous generation, he said, that life arose from non-living matter was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. That leaves us with only one possible conclusion, that life arose as a supernatural creative act of God. But I want you to listen to this, perhaps the saddest words I have read in a long time. He said, but I will not accept that because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe what I know is scientifically impossible. To say that it just happened is impossible, but I believe it because I do not want to believe God. That's the reality. Evolution is far from scientific fact. It's a religious philosophy that is incompatible with the Bible because it undermines the core beliefs of Christianity. Listen, I'm glad you have an opportunity to watch this on YouTube. If you have questions, as I, as I mention every week, if you have questions, the Facebook post where you saw this, where you found a link for the YouTube video, type your questions there. Or if you don't want to ask it publicly, I, I, I get it, I understand. Send it to me in a private message. Send it to me via WhatsApp. I'll put the question out and the answer. I won't say who asked the question if you send it to me privately. But I want to give you some opportunity. If you have questions, if you want to make comments, or if there's anything that I didn't cover in this lesson that you want me to talk a little bit more about, as I mentioned, there's a whole lot more that we could say about this. But the bottom line is this, believer, that we trust and believe that the word of God is true. Every word of it, every sentence, every jot, every tittle. And that means that evolution cannot be true. It's not scientific fact. It's far from it. The Bible is way more compatible, absolutely 100% compatible with science. Evolution is not. And evolution undercuts who we know God to be and what we believe about him and the basic tenets of our Christian faith. Well, I hope you have a great week. I hope you have a, a blessed time of just walking with the Lord this week. If you have questions, send them to me. Ask me. I'll be glad to answer some of those additional follow-on questions. Let's pray together, and then we'll end our time tonight. Father, we thank you once again that we could come together, that we can open up your word, that we can talk about you and how great you are, 
and we can really come to your word and understand some of the, the challenges and the questions that we have in this day and age. Is evolution true? And we, we just we look at that scientifically and logically and we realize it's not. We look at it through the lens of your word and we say it absolutely cannot be compatible with Christianity. Father, help us to believe your word, not question it, not reevaluate it based on the lens of what society tells us. And Father, help us to be, to be strong apologists for you, people who know what we believe and why we believe it, that we can make your name great. As we lift you up, you'll draw men to yourself. Father, I thank you for those that are watching this YouTube video. And Lord, I pray for your blessing on them, those that even that could not they can't watch it this week, but Lord, I pray your blessing on them just the same. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for all you do for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, good night. And God bless you. Have a great week.